can't happen is out of your control is that, sorry, I'm just going to start that sentence again. Lots of new teachers feel that as long as they teach something right the first time, it's going to be fine. And what actually happens in real life is that you teach something perhaps perfectly, like gold star standard, and one day, whether it's after the summer holidays or whether it's just in the middle of the term, your kid suddenly comes back and has a completely rubbish blow hole, or their violin position has moved, or, you know, they are not playing in tune when they were before. I think that's less common because playing in tune is about your ears, not about your body. But, you know, often these, we set up our students to have beautiful technique and then something weird happens and we don't know why it's not beautiful anymore. And, you know, it's not really very useful to identify why it's not, why it's not beautiful anymore. It may be that they've gone on holiday and not practised. Uh, it may also be that, you know, the parent hasn't been checking for a certain thing and, you know, there's just been a tipping point of where not checking has turned into, yeah, distance to sleep, but still recording, thank you. Um, you know, it may be that their body has grown and suddenly they can't, you know, the, the, the shell dress doesn't feel comfortable anymore, so they've moved it into a place that it feels comfortable and suddenly, you know, everything has kind of um, changed and not working in the way that it should. Um, and this is where having the toolkit that is the review pieces, and especially once you have that toolkit accessible in your mind in um, strands of development like we've started talking about today, as well as, you know, the first piece in book one is going to call the second pieces, blah, 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 uh, as a kind of linear organisation of pieces, is really helpful because you can help your students address those technical issues while also focusing on one type of thing. Yeah? So, for example, if you have a bow hold problem and it's fine when they're playing really super easy pieces, but as soon as they start to do up bow staccato, the thumb is going straight or they're not squeezing for the up bows, they're just pushing. You need to know, right, the pieces for up bow staccato are Bex. Um, it's not like proper frustration, is it? That's just up up. Well done. Um Um Minuets uh three. All of the minuets. All, all yeah, minuets. all of the minuets. Yeah, Good. The minuet minuets. bowing, we call it. Good. And then um Happy Farmer. Yeah, the happy farmer a bit, I mean it does go ah, oh, ah, oh, yeah. but it's not really repeated up bow staccato. In book one, the minuets are the thing for that. And then Joe. In fact, you said this this morning. Yes. <laughs> Good. And then Ed. Yes. And then Sorry. And then what was the other thing? Minuet G. Um, yes. Yeah. Oh, that's not okay. Um, the FA. Thank you. Yeah. So that is your up bow staccato toolkit. And if you've got a kid in book four who cannot do up bow staccato properly, which is perfectly possible, you want to take them right back. Can you play beautiful minuets with the right type of tone and bow hold on your up bows? Yes, you can. Right. What happens when we go into long, long ago variation? Ah, oh, then it starts to go, you know, the thing that you will hear if you have a faulty bow hand in, um, in repeated up bow staccato, what you will hear is that there is no parity between the two notes. So you'll hear... <laughs> And rather than that, because they're not actually getting into the string and then releasing in a coordinated manner, which is obviously why doing minuet is really useful because there's loads of space and it's slow and it's not just playing the piece they're working on really slowly. Mm -hmm. And then witches dances the other one that's kind of you know you will notice in witches dances they have up bow staccato problems even though it's dotted because yeah. you're. Yeah. You'll hear that. Yeah? Um, so in an actual lesson, how
how would this look? Let's say um, Birdie has been on holiday for three weeks, not necessarily without her garden, but you know, it's the end of the, the, the holidays, and she comes back and I say, okay, you know, her working piece is waltz. So I say, um, okay, great, well, let's play Judas to warm up, and then which review would you love to play me? And she plays me long, long ago, and the variation is sounding like that. What would actually, what would I need to do in the lesson? So we're maybe five minutes into the lesson at this point. You do know that one. Or it'll do a twinkle and then let Barry twinkle. Good, even before that. Check that it's all working. Yeah, that you actually understand the technique. That they, what are the three C's, Bex? Oh, the three C's? Yes. You talked about them like that, didn't you? Um, coordination? I don't know. No, okay. <laughs> Kit, do you remember the three C's? Or any one of them? Maybe it was the other two that we talked it about was, a little bit recently. I remember talking about the three C's, but from ages ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember you yeah. asked me in my lesson a couple oh. of ago. <laughs> that is what I'm talking so about. So the staircase, the staircase to unconscious competence uh, oh, cool. is, is the phrase. Comprehension, cooperation, and consolidate. Consolidation. Consolidation. <laughs> Very good. And Ed Kreitman does call it constructive repetition, the third C. But I just don't like that because it's not three words starting with C, so I'm going for consolidation. So, comprehension, you've got to understand what it is you're trying to do. Yes. And understanding doesn't necessarily mean intellectual understanding, but it means the child has got to understand what they're trying to hear, what they're trying to feel, how it should all come together. Comprehension. Cooperation, they can do it when they're really thinking about it when it's maybe being taken out of context. So, for example, to stick with the Arco Staccato thing, um, Kit, what would be one of the non-playing exercises you would do to check that Birdie's going to be able to do her Arco's in minuet correctly? Good, but, but, but. and before playing it, what would you do to make sure you don't get this. Make sure she's stopping after the, the, the. Good, so you might say, let's do some squeezes here. Mm. Let's do some squeezes here. Let's do some squeezes here. And then you might say, okay, let's do a nice scoopy down bow. And then we're gonna have two scoops, so engage, check. Is it engaged in the string? Release, is it not engaged in the string? Yeah, okay, and then engage again. So that you're going to get all of those, if you think about every note you play, it's got to have a beginning, a middle and an end, even though that's so obvious. Yeah, when you actually think about these three notes, that gives us an awful lot of things to check. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So for up bow staccato, obviously check the bow roll is actually the correct shape, but also this is a really key part of that and you can do it on your finger. Do you remember doing that with mm -hmm. me? We were doing it together yeah. in maybe level two. But you know, can you, do you want to make your finger very strong. Let's just get in pairs. One person make a strong finger, the other person, I don't think I can, thank you. Uh, the other person make a bow hold on it. Um, and I, can you do those up bow staccato type squeezes? Bex, could you change your angle so that you're even more helpful? Yeah. Oh, Kit, I can see a very straight thumb there. We go. <laughs> okay, so squeeze, squeeze, just, just still. No, I'm not bending with Bend your thumb. Yeah. That's it. So squeeze, release, squeeze, release. That's what you want to be able to do on the bow. Okay. And then swap. Is everyone ready? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Squid, isn't it? So that's it. Yeah. Yeah? So that would be the first thing you would do. <laughs> and that, and then the next step of that is can you do it on the string when you're looking for the stick going down towards the hair? And then you add in the up bows. And then you add in the down bows. And then you check everything in between. And that's like, you know, very in depth. I didn't realise that Kinch was incorporating them at one. 
I put it into just the other actually. If you just do the elbow, you just won't have the clarity in between the notes. So you'll get, but if you get that faster, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. So the pinch in the hand, it's, I always say like the engine is the elbow, like the driver. You know, your, your energy and depth comes from your elbow and the hand is like steering. You know, you can, if you put your foot flat to the floor in your car, you can drive to the end of the road without touching the steering wheel, can't you, really fast. Mm. But then as soon as you've actually got to like go anywhere other than straight, mm. you're gonna need the driving, the steering yeah. as well. Mm. So your hand does the sort of fine stuff and your elbow does the big stuff. So you want to break down the skill that they need as far as you can. And then the thing is, if you have a student who is fine at all the basic stuff, it's not a problem at all that you've gone back to being basic because you just whiz through all of the stages that they're already fine with. You may find when you go back to, right, let's make a perfect bow hold, that actually the problem is she can't currently hold a bow mm. in the way that you want her to at all, perhaps, or for a twinkle variation. And then you don't even worry about art based staccato because you've got to fix that bow hold. Yeah? It might be a thumb top bend, it might be... It might be all sorts of things, exactly. And so then once you know, okay, yes, I now have an, a good bow hold, then you can step into the art based staccato thing. But, so Joe, tell us how, if you were, if you had realised, oh right, the, the basic problem is that the bow hold's gone, mm -hmm. how would you help a child who is in the middle of book two to reform a decent bow hold? What would you actually do in those lessons and what would you set for practice? I would take it back to twin holds mm -hmm. and get them to do more like twin holds. But I would. If she not, can't not, even keep the bow for a busy, busy stop, stop. Yeah, I'd get her to play twinkle queen and stop at random points and check mm -hmm. if they've thumb stopped and that maybe mum or dad could check that it's. Something I've got from, from the National Workshop, just checking that the thumb. Oh, is yeah, like a doorbell. Yeah, that was so I nice. Love that. Yeah. So, well, to, and to even electric doorbells, you still mostly have to press a button. Yeah. Yeah, so let's just, let's just tell everybody. So, this guy, James, um, was doing a really so brilliant pre twinkle brief lesson. And if you want to try this in your lesson, you totally can. One of the things that he was doing was like, okay, we've got to ring the doorbell. And if this doorbell, even if it's the right shape, if it's so hard that you can't actually move it at all, then you're not going to get a good sound. So can you, have you got a doorbell that you can actually sort of push? Oh. And then like, can you go to your parents and can they ring your doorbell? Um, why don't you just grab your bows rather than pens? Because <laughs> it does feel slightly yeah. different. Ding, ding. Which is up my alley when it comes to sound. Well, yeah. and, and the yeah, yeah. And you know, he was doing, can you do the doorbell on your head? Uh, you know, poke it out from your nose, have you still got it? And it's very small, it's not like, you know, just exactly like a doorbell. You don't want to have to be able to press it like a whole centimetre. And we're talking about pre twinkles, so they have their thumbs out. No, physically feeling it for myself, it's easier to do it than for someone on the inside. Yes, it definitely but is. on the outside, I don't know how I would... Oh, I Basically, know. I guess when you're on the outside, what you're checking for is that it's not just really tense. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess so, but yeah. Oh, I do. So I just put yeah. it on my shoulder then and did it so I could feel it myself. And that might be something that... Yeah, good. What to do, and then I would, uh, yes, yeah, twinkle clean, random stops. So, as you're playing out. twinkle, yeah, you can do random stops. Kit, what else can you do? Thank you, Joe. What else can you do to check while they're playing that they are doing the right thing? That's one of the things you want them to do right, yeah. But what game could you play so that if something goes wrong, for example, the pinky goes straight or the thumb goes straight? Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I mean, what will you do while they're playing in Twinkle Thing, for example, if you see that their thumb has gone straight? Well, A, you have to be looking at their thumb, which does mean normally sit on the floor. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the one thing that's causing my problem when I turn them to the flat one. And that's caused a problem? If that's the one thing that is the problem. Mm -hmm. oh, if that's the origin of the problem, that's where it's starting off. Okay, we're going to do this, and then we find your thumb straight up. Well, the flag game, that is exactly what it's designed for, is to stop you having to say, no, stop, your thumb's gone wrong again, all of the negative, horrible things nobody wants to hear. Turn it into a game, ah, oh, thanks, you gave me away. And they'll fix it, and they'll want, to, they'll want to beat you much more because you're pretending to have a good time than they would do. You know, you run the risk if you're just like, no, no, come on, fix your thumb, they're just gonna shut down. Um, Good, and so then if you've got a child who, however long in, it might be 10 minutes into this lesson, it might be two weeks later, can now, okay, yes, I can play all of my twinkles with a perfect bow hold. What happens next? Thanks. Oh, uh, sorry, say that again, sorry. So if you, that's no, right, sorry. You've gone from having a child who can't really make that bow hold anymore, yeah. can't keep it while they're playing, to a child who can, because you've used the flag game, you've talked them through, you've, been, you've reviewed what they're actually looking for, and so they can play all of their twinkles, playing the flag game, there's no problem, they can do that perfectly. What, what's the next stage for a book two kid who's having bow hold problems? Cool. Um, next would be going into pieces. Um, God, I mean, like, they're all good for practicing a good bow hold. So I've sort of reviewed some book one pieces to start off with so that it's really easy for them to keep. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it sounds really obvious, right? But this is what a lot of people don't do, which is why we're talking about it now. Is So, yeah, you, if, they, if they can do a perfect twinkle, don't be like, right, let's try a minuet. Be like, okay, let's try a lightly row. Let's try go to Aunt Brody. Let's try a long, long ago. You know, you might not work through every single piece, but you do, you know, the, the progression of the pieces is very well set to introduce difficult things at opportune, opportune times, like good times for those difficult things to come in. So if you are using the review to reteach something and to refine something, you want to keep, not every single piece, but you want to keep that kind of broad structure of like, right, we've done Twinkle, we can do Twinkle, great. Let's say if you can do three really super simple book one pieces. Once you can do three super simple book one pieces, maybe in a row before you move on, well, how about if we just introduce the D string and the G string? Can you keep that perfect bow hold on etude? You may find they can do long, long ago absolutely perfectly, and as soon as etude is introduced, it's all over the shop again. Because, Ed, uh, every time I do that to you, you're like, oh, oh, okay, I'm I am doing it to everyone. Oh, no, I know, but it's just, uh, I'm following threads and I realise I have to think. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that is. It's a, it's a, the struggle is real today for some reason. <laughs> um, so if you're getting into etude and a final call back on what is causing the, what is... What could be. What could be um, suddenly the, the fear of it. So they're quite uh, short stroke. We've already covered short stroke mm -hmm. before, so I shouldn't do that. If, if it's with the, the left hand, concern with the left hand, are you gripping and losing your shoulders and you're losing Good, so it might be because the left hand is just harder. Yeah. Yeah. What else could it be? Um, uh, more, more of a string crossing? Etude, which one's etude? It's more string crossing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's got perpetual motion, so it's etude, and there is the string crossing. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, and it's and G major. So uh, yeah. you've yeah. introduced, if you go from long, long ago, book one, to right, let's see how it is in etude, basically, you're likely to help that child fail rather than help that child succeed. Because if you're thinking about long, long ago, easy bow strokes, two notes on D, simple tune, not very much there in terms of big challenges, right? And so the next step that would be much better if you want to make it a little bit harder would be, go. So it's not etude. No, etude is too much of a jump from long, long ago. Yeah. Or allegretto or andantino, but not, you know, so 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take that perpetual yeah. motion is suddenly a longer piece but harder to remember. Yeah. Longer piece and harder to remember, but quite simple, like it doesn't mean anything on two strings. Da -da -da -da. It might be the doubles that undoes them. They might suddenly, as soon as they're moving their hands fast, just lose the focus on the bow and it clicks yeah. up into a straight thumb. Yeah. And that's the thing. So then you would go back to. Well done. Um, and then you build up, yeah, right, let's try Alberta or Alberta, you know? Okay. And then they might need to go away for a week and practice at you before they are able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so all of this sounds great, right? You've got a problem. Ah, there's the recipe. There's a solution recipe. Brilliant. Now I know exactly what to do if my student tomorrow turns up with a rubbish bow hold. I was going to say, you also do Alberta when you're finished with action. Yeah, I mean, you can do everything that's in book one, you can do again, even if they're in book two, right? Mm -hmm. And you can do better and more refined versions of them. Mm -hmm. um, but the same challenges as you had the first time you went through book one will occur if you try and miss out big chunks of book one while you're asking them to think about something new. Yeah. Um, then, you know, the same flaws are possible. Um, all of this requires what from your student in terms of giving this perfect lesson where well, <laughs> you <laughs> <laughs> and so how how do we make sure that our students aren't just like oh actually yeah <laughs>
Yeah, that sounds like a van, right? Yeah, yeah. I might just put one of the um, lines up. How will we set practice and how will we maintain that setting of practice over the years of our students' learning? To make sure that when they come back from this um, make believe three weeks, <laughs> I hope it is make believe, poor Birdie's just going to be like, you <laughs> invented this for me and now it's real. She's going to throw the, the rubbish bowl off. How are you going to make sure that you can give those lessons that we've been talking about? Uh, <laughs> Run the whole question again, please. So, here's the scenario. You've got a student mm -hmm. who's developed a problem with their bow hold. Yeah. You know what you need to do in order to help them with the bow hold. You've mm -hmm. gone through this is exactly what your bow hold should be, like a little mini pre-twinkle lesson. You've gone through twinkle to find out whether they can keep it. They've got to whichever review piece, ah, they've got to whichever review piece they can get up to, and then it's all fallen apart because they don't know their review pieces. How do you make sure that in the alternate world of that child comes back from their three weeks of um, Easter holidays, they have still developed a problem with their bowhold, which has nothing to do with whether they're playing with you or not. Uh, but you can deliver this perfect lesson where you work your way through their review pieces. What do you need to think about in all of your teaching up until that point, so that that point is available to you whenever you need it? Set different pieces to review each week. Good. So how are we, like what review are you setting in practice? Like what would you set for a child who's on perpetual motion? Um, like third time on roadie, but or like something week in week out. What do you want your children to be doing when you're not in front of them in their lessons? What do you want them to be? What? How does this review thing look like? What does it look like in their? Oh, practice? what you mean? Like so, one day they do one piece, the next day they do another piece. Yeah, you could have them do like a, a different review piece every day, working their way through. Yeah. Okay. Do you know what number piece? Motion is? Uh, um, I know where it comes. Yeah. I think it's number nine. Something like that. I think it's number nine. Oh, there are there five. Oh, sorry? No. I'm oh, sorry. Six is their song. I know that much. <laughs> so seven. Eight. Seven, yeah. Nine. 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 Yeah. Um, so then there are five extra twinkles, right? Because twinkle theme is only like the twinkle theme of all of those twinkles is one. So that's actually 14 pieces. So if they're playing one piece each practice, even if they are practicing every single day, that's two weeks in between playing a piece and then playing it again, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Unlikely to keep it in there. Depends how much they learn by ear. Like some kids will just know how it goes and how to play it just from listening. But what do we think would be an average amount of practice time that a mid book one student is spending on violin practice? Eh? Mid book one student. Yeah. Obviously, there's a huge divergence, but as a kind of middle road. Uh, mid book one student, I, and this is just on playing, rather than what's in the range and what's in the box. Yeah, yeah, their actual practice. Their actual practice. Um, I mean, I'd be amazed if they all did 15 to 20 minutes every day. But quite a lot of them probably do 10 to 15. 10 to 15. 10 to 15, yeah. 15 minutes, yeah. yeah. So it's going to take. So, what are you going to set in that 15 minutes practice? Pick what is some of it? Um, a twinkle. Uh -huh. Maybe two? Yeah. Yeah. That's. Um, like some lightly row or something. A review piece? A review piece. A review piece, yeah. So, okay. If we do two twinkles, that takes about three minutes. And another review piece, most of them are under a minute in the first half, so that's three minutes. Yeah. Mm. Go. Um, I would get my twinkle children, just because I think it's a good piece to do all the time. Okay. I would do it every single day from the book. And I would set them another piece that doesn't start in the middle of the row, because otherwise they think the whole piece is starting in. So good. Something closer to the rhythmic nature. So of at the moment time. we're doing one or two twinkles and two. three review pieces so far. Yeah. Good. Um, 
So they live the full quiet. You've got the worst in peace with Sean. Well, no one said anything about working peace yet, so why no. are you telling us about that? Well, the working peace. So, interesting is whether you would put that, where you put that in practice, because there's achievement in practice and there's achievement in enjoying pain. So where do you want the enjoying pain going into it and do you want, you want to... Okay, let's not worry too much about the order at the moment, yeah. let's just get like nut down what it is that would be in the practice. So far we've got two twinkles, three and three pieces. What does it look like? What does the working piece look like? Um, well if you've got practice boxes, so you've got to do the practice boxes. Good. Um, if, if that's the previews for the next pieces, that's that. If you've got the piece that you are working on, uh, so you've got preview boxes for next piece, or you've got the practice boxes or whole piece, which you're working on to do kind of Great. Practice. So as you first start a new piece, if you are teaching your students to play by ear and they are working those pieces out, you would probably have a box that you've taught them. Like let's say they're on Allegro, you've taught them how to play do 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 because you want them to keep the one down. It's a little bit tricky with the skip at the end, uh, and that's the box that you want them to practice. <laughs> Connor took that chair from oh. where he's depositing it now about six months ago, and obviously just broken it up. But he's like. Is that all that'll really? 
you have to be like fixing up, like building it better. Yeah, so review just means that you've already got your credit for it or you're not working on it as your working piece anymore. Mm. Um, the thing we were doing this morning, like with the slurs, so once you get further on, there are specific pieces that will help you to get your working piece to understand how to do that properly. So, for example, if you are on Minuet 3 and your slurs, or let's say if you're on uh, Waltz in Book 2 and your slurs aren't very good, aren't very clear, and good tone, you can go back to Minuet 3 and be like, okay, this is the piece that you can practice your slurs in because it's easier and it will help you because it's got so many slurs in. Whereas you could go back to Happy Farmer and there's only one slur in it. But you would call that review? Yeah. Right, because actually there is something which I believe is part of the you know, the same thing. Each the, each piece that's discussed would be responsible either for where it's at or if it's running out. Um, there are these points we say on review we do this. We just keep move on from this piece, but on review we do this. So it's a question of keeping things in review. It's not necessarily just to fix a problem, you're just keeping things in review. Yes, yeah, also to refine them. So to refine them and get them better. So there are things in the wording of how we approach them. We say we do things on review because you, the use of the word review is not, it's the, it's the action rather than. It's yeah, it's a verb as well as a noun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the word. Yeah. It's a doing is, word as well as a thing word. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, absolutely. So that's where some of the confusion can, can be. I feel if that's where you're. I remember if you're in book two, you shouldn't be playing book one pieces as your book one student. You should be using the refinement of some of your skills that you've got in book two to enhance what you need to be doing in book one. So if your student, for me, if your student still sounds like it's sounding like they've either got the credit and they're in book two or book three, I'm like, no, no, no. Yeah. You can play better than that because you've got all this, these skills, you pull them together and you pour what you've got into that review piece. And it gives you a chance to do it with something you're supposed to know more because you've done it more, so you're more fluent with it. Um, like learning how to speak with an American accent, I guess, if you ever wanted to do such a thing. Well, or just learning to speak. Like, yeah. if you don't learn how to say mummy and daddy age two and then continue to use that same inflection and difficulty in pronunciation by the time we're five, ten, or twenty-five. <laughs> yeah, and so it's like you always bring it back to the mother tongue method. like we are teaching our students in the same way as we learn our language. And when you learn language, you learn a bunch of words and vocabulary, but you don't forget your old words and your vocabulary just because you've learned some new ones. And you keep on refining how you can use your vocabulary as you get older. Mm. And that is what we're trying to do with the music. Mm. So to come back to the actual kind of recipe for your practice, I think for a book one student, so you may have a small sight read. They might not have started doing sight reading off the page yet, but I would hope there'd be something about sight reading in the practice at a level kind of level. They'd just be starting. It might be um, rhythm cards. It might be you know a general musicianship like don't shout this one back kind of game. Um, but there should be something, and I do recommend you say to your students that they should do that second, because sight reading is often the um, yeah the the casualty of running out of time, whereas. The, you, you, they, if you do your working piece last, they will not run out of time, they'll be able to do it because that's what they think is the whole point of practice. <laughs> um, so they will make sure that that does happen. Um, so if you're in a 15 minute practice at that level, it's very easy to think, oh, they're only five, they're only six, they can't really do very much. So we'll do one twinkle, one review piece and a working piece. And actually that's about four minutes of practice. And obviously in 15 minutes of practice, there's probably only 10 minutes of practice happening. But if you can get, you know, what could we do in 10 minutes in early book one? Two twinkles, five review pieces, one practice box and a playthrough, probably. They're really, really small and short actual amounts of time that these things take. So you do definitely want to try and get, even by the end of book one, I want them to be playing their review pieces every three days, at the, at the least, really. You know, so they're playing like seven or eight pieces each practice. And that's the bit that should be pleasurable, as long as they haven't forgotten them. And that's when people say, I hate review, and it's like, 
Do you really hate a piece that you can play really beautifully and easily? No, you hate a piece you can't remember. Yeah. And then occasionally they do also hate a piece because it's difficult. But you know, most of the time, okay. it's because they can't remember it. And if you're just playing and you're enjoying, you know, playing a beautiful piece, and you know, you, your mum is saying, just remember to keep your eye on your bow. Well, let's make sure you've got a bent thumb, but it's not difficult for you to do that. Then that's where practice can actually become pleasurable. And that is what we want at the baseline, isn't it? It's like for the kids to want to play and the parents to want to practice with them. So that it's not just a massive 10 year trial and hopefully at the end of 10 years they'll want to play something. <laughs> Query. Yes. at different times. If you're reviewing something for a solo, you're going to practice it every single practice, you're going to put a practice box into it, you're going to practice making your announcement, doing the solo, you're going to really try and find ways to make it even better every time. If you're reviewing Go Tell Not Roadie so that when your teacher wants to play the flag game to have beautiful posture, you can play Go Tell Not Roadie in beautiful posture, then that probably is one through. And you know, how, what you, how you respond if you're playing, let's say, mm, May song and they can't remember, do, 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 it takes a few times. Whether you would say, okay, we'll practice that five times and each practice this week and drop another review piece so that that piece gets better, or whether you would wait for a week and see if it's fixed up by the next week, kind of more organically. It's up to you and the parent and the kind of child that you're teaching. Um, so I don't think there's a kind of hard and fast rule. But I think that the children should understand, maybe not by a Lebro standard, but at the Lebro I think they're pretty much just trying to remember them. Yeah. And, and the other benefits come sort of more subconsciously. But certainly by the time they're in book two, I think they should realise that they are playing, you know, like you can say to your book two student, wow, that is a really book two lightly row. You could not play it like that when you were just learning it. Kids in book one can't play it anywhere near as good as that. And they understand what that means. You know, and that makes them feel proud. Mm. And therefore they don't mind because they're playing, you know, and like you could go completely over the top if it's an amazing, oh my goodness, that was a book 10 lightly row. Like, because they understand that, you know, they might be a book two, but they can't play it as well as you. And you can't play it as well as Hilary Harm. Hilary Harm can't play it as well as God. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think that you can, yeah. But I think at least at that level, really early, at least 75% of their practice should be stuff they already know how to do. Because you want the amount of struggle that they need to go through to be very minimal. And you want to make sure that when they are struggling with something, it's been broken down. So yeah, it's tricky, but it's not like it doesn't feel impossible. You haven't set them up to fail. Like the proper music pieces, right? 
So you're going to do, I don't know, two folk songs, two etudes and one real piece each practice and put them on rotation. Um, but just something that means that you know that they're getting through all of those pieces. Other questions, thoughts? As we have 10 minutes, I think the thing I would like to finish with then is talking about what happens if you shock horror, start teaching this afternoon and you realise that all of your students have not been doing the um, uh, review in the way that you hoped they would be doing and they can play three pieces rather than ten pieces. Um, oh, so that's another thing to mention. For me, for my students, and this has worked very well for me for a long time, I keep a book's worth of review in hand. I am not one of those extremely hardcore teachers who is asking their students to review all of the pieces they've ever learned up to book four, which some students are asked to do. I'm not sure how many of them actually would do it. Um, but a book's worth, and then there are certain pieces that are always so useful that they just keep them in, mostly also they come up so often at workshops and in groups and stuff like that that they don't really have to play them in with you at home, they just kind of know them because they're kind of core pieces. But one book's worth of review, so if you're on the fourth piece of book two, you play from the fifth piece of book one, up to your working piece. And then let's quickly, which core reviews would you want to keep in in hand, maybe not every week, but which ones are the ones that you you want your students to be able to play even when they're in book five from book one? Obviously. Thank you. Can someone turn the camera around? Oh. Oh, okay. 
when you graduate level 10, then 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So Gossip is always in there, and that's why it comes up often at play togethers and stuff as well, is because it's expected that the senior students know it. Same with Mini G, same with Bart Burry, um, because they do have to review it once every so often towards graduation. And then plus one book's worth of pieces. But I mean, most of these, my, you know, my book four and five students wouldn't play these every practice. They just play them when they're, like, a perpetual motion gets played all the time because they're practicing it in different positions and stuff. I mean, you know, three, if they're in book three or four, they'll probably still remember it. It's probably still one of their re reviews from book three. Um, the twinkles, they never stop playing. But, you know, these, they just kind of pull out when they need them, really. It doesn't take them long to get them back under their fingers if they've been playing them that for that long. So, the last thing I want to do, and is three minutes long enough? Probably not. Uh, what do you do if you, yeah, what, what are you going to do if your student comes back this afternoon and they've practiced every day of the Easter holidays, but they can't remember any of their reviews if they only play their working piece? Let's say any but one student. Listen to recording. Good, check the listening, excellent. Listen to recording the lesson. Uh, could do. Can play it? Okay, so if you're going to reteach it to them, that's going to probably take you quite a lot of your lessons. So. Exactly, right. So if we imagine, uh, I'm not going to write up all of the pieces, but so if we imagine that we've got a child who's on minuet three and they come back and they say, oh no, we haven't done that review, oh no, we haven't done that review, and you say, what well, actually have you reviewed? And you realise, oh right, I've really lost, I've really taken my eye off the ball and I've got to sort this out. If you just say to them, okay, so next week I want to hear loads of reviews, can you come back with all of book one fixed up? They're going to be like, not on your nelly, because that's totally unrealistic. So what you are going to say to the parent is, in the front of your book one is the contents page of the piece, of the pieces, right? I want you to spend a practice this week trying each of the pieces and then I want you to put an A or a B next to the name of that piece. A means you can get from start to finish, yes with some mistakes, but you can play that piece. B means you cannot remember how that piece goes, it needs to be relearned, right? And so then after this one practice, it might take two practices, after this, these practices of like assessment of each of the pieces, you're going to have a list of A's and B's, or maybe you have one A and nine B's, but it doesn't matter. Then what you're going to do is you're going to pick your favourite B and you're going to practice that like your working piece until you can rub out that B and put an A next to it. And then you're going to play both of your A's and pick a new B and work on that. So if you're imagining that your ideal is that they're doing eight reviews and their working piece and the practicality, at the, 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 the reality at this moment is they're doing no reviews or one twinkle and their working piece, what you want to do is get the balance readdressed and it takes time to do that, yeah? So you so you play all the pieces that you can, or you play half the pieces that you can if there are more of them, then you pick one piece that you want to just move over into the A column. And then once that col column has had one more piece moved into it, you pick another piece. And then it might take you six months to get to the stage where all of your reviews are brilliant, but you will do it and your child will not be having screaming fits every practice. Whereas if you try and get a whole book's worth of review that's all been forgotten, back to being able to be played from start to finish well, nobody's going to be happy. Does that make sense as a sort of task, like how you would yeah. actually explain yeah. that and how it would work? Yeah. And then you can say, okay, next week I'd like to hear one A and one B, and do you want any help with B, and I can help you. And then the week after that, I'll be able to hear two A's and one B. And then the week after that, I'll be able to hear three A's and one B. And then however long it will take, You'll have your toolkit so, back. So you listen to the A's? I would hear an A, you definitely. A. I want, oh, because okay. also you want to reinforce to the parent and the student that the point of review is that they can play it well to you. The point of review is not that you reteach it to them. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, right, let's work on making a beautiful sound in Lightly Row, because you can remember that. Or even on the first bar of Lightly Row, if you can't remember any of the rest of it. And then next week, let's see if you can... And yeah. you would only really hear the bees that they need help with. 
like, we can't remember how to fix up this problem with long, long ago. Okay, well, show it to me and I'll tell you. But not just, it goes, D1, 2, 2, 4, 3, now your turn. D1, 2, 2, 4, 3. I mean, I hope that none of you ever teach even a working piece like that. But when I walk around this building, I hear a lot of people teaching pieces. And that means that we're not teaching very little. I mean, look, we've all been guilty of it sometimes. Yeah. But, you know, as a general rule, you want to be teaching music and teaching the parent how to teach their own child. You do not want to be teaching every single note to every single piece because that's when you have children who are in group one for seven years, which sounds ludicrous, but actually, there are quite a lot of ten-year-olds who are still in group one, nationally speaking. Um, <laughs> sad thing is, I'm just trying to picture, like, uh, Because they're just there's just not coming around often enough. You know, and it's easy to think that they're gonna make a real stink about that. But I mean Hal, who is I think might be seven now, but you know, it's pretty dizzy, yeah. does five or six pieces in his practices most times, fairly without too much. And um, <laughs> um, so I'm still I'm still relatively new to this all this whole game of review and and in the teaching world that teaching this year. So I'm, I'm getting the concept of it, I'm not fully up in the practice of it, and I'm going to hit glitches, I know. I'm of course. Deal, deal with glitches. Because the big glitch is that feeling of progression and not wanting to feel like you're regressing mm -hmm. within a lesson that people are paid you to be there for. Yeah. <laughs> and, and also not be, being fearful that the child doesn't feel like they are progressing, or the student doesn't feel like they are regressing. It, it is a a valid thing to go back and go back to these very things and there, is, there should be frustration built out that there is progression to go forward. So yeah. the magic phrase I think for the parents and the kids is the more review you do the easier your working pieces will become because all of the skills that are in your review pieces are also in your working piece and the better you are at them in the old pieces the easier they will be to find in your new piece. And I also think it's very easy for us to think if I'm doing all this review, they're going to be learning like one piece every half term and, you know, they're never going to learn anything. But if you are using the time that you have when you're teaching, like, you know, how to play by ear, how to work out a piece, how to do your sight reading, they have the skills that mean they, they come with a lot of that music able to be played without you ever having heard it. And that's where you kind of hit the magic spot that you can spend 22 minutes out of a 30 minute lesson doing review and sight reading and games. And yet you have a student who goes faster than someone where you spent 22 minutes a week helping them how to do their top piece. Because, and that's the bit that I really didn't believe when I first tried doing 75% of the time on review. I was just like, I'm gonna try this for two years but I don't think it will work. But if Ed Crowman says it works, I'm going to try it because I have immense respect for him as a teacher and I see him, I've seen his students play. And it, it just does work. <laughs> it just really does. Like they, you know, as long as you've got the core ingredients of learning to play by ear, being able to understand the written music for whatever level they're at, they're not using music reading really until book three to work out their Suzuki pieces, the listening and the preview so that you are helping them with the bits they're not going to be able to work out. It really does come together as like the perfect combination, which means that they can really fly. Can I ask, um, I know probably part of the answer is maybe I need to teach more of a check, communicate with parents as to what's happening at home. But I'm finding the temptation is, especially for some of the new students who don't have as many pieces under their belt mm -hmm. or as much experience, that the parent helps them so much to work out the notes that the child isn't doing it. The parent's just working out the notes and, and writing the numbers down and giving it to them. So what can I do to help that not happen? <laughs> okay, rather than 
describe what we'll do. I'll just pretend that that's you. Yeah. Right. This week, you are going to try and work out the first bar of your new piece. A mum's not even allowed in the room. So you're going to do your practice. And then when you've done your practice and it's time to do that part of the practice together, you're going to say to mummy, well, mummy, Joe says now you have to leave and I have to do it by myself. And then I'll call you back in and I'll show you what I've worked out. And then mum understands that they're not supposed to be doing that. I hope they already understand they're not supposed to be doing it, but they're kind of guiltily secretly doing it. Yeah. And you say, this is how your child is going to learn actually to play by ear. Because I know that you're not going to be able to sit there and not say, it's D3. Because it's so tempting and you want to help your child. And I understand that you want to help your child. But what you are doing by helping them like that is like doing their homework for them. They're not actually doing the learning. So take yourself out of the equation. They're going to be super excited to do a tiny bit of practice by themselves. And say, okay, I'm going to set the timer. You've got three minutes to try and work out the first tiny bit of the next piece. And the only information they need is what the first note is. And you must give them that because otherwise you get like the crumb back thing. Like you've already started on you know, two instead of E or whatever. Mm. I mean, I don't think any of my students are working out entirely by ear by library yet, but certainly by mid book one, mm. you know. And then you can also teach them how to teach the kids how to do that together. So you demonstrate, like, this is how you work out a piece by ear. Let's play, can you play? Dun, dun, dun. It starts on B. Can you find those notes? They might play some wrong notes. You just keep going with them. All right, you've got it. Do, do, do. Excellent. Okay, can you play? Do, do. They might get it the first time. They might take five tries to get it. And then you add a, a note or two notes at a time. And you go, do you recognise this tune yet? Do, 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 do. You've just taught yourself by it. All I've done is say, can you find it and play it to you? I haven't given you a single finger number. I haven't told you anything except the first note. And that's what parents can do at home. Is can, you, can we sing the next bit? Can you find it on your violin? Not, it goes D1, 2, 2, A3. All right? <laughs> You're welcome. Um, okay, you two will find a group. Mm -hmm. I will be watching, but then I can't stay right until the end because I've got a class at 5.15 somewhere else. So, um, why do, it starts at 4.20. 4.20, we'll take the first, up. we've got a, yeah, basically by the time of June, registered vows and the Big Brother Chicken is probably about half full. Yeah. So we've got... Who's going first? Anne. Joe's going first. Ten minutes, ten minutes, and I'll finish up. Great. So why don't... Is it okay with you if I just leave you both a voice note with feedback? Mm-hmm. It's going to be very lovely feedback, obviously. Um, but I just don't really have time to hang around and then talk to you. Like, I'll just be like, yes, well done, wait, I've got to go. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's not ideal. Um, okay, brilliant. Cool. Yeah. And then what's useful, I think, if you do that yourself as well, so just take a moment after it's happened to work down, I thought I did this well, I felt like I messed this up, or I wasn't sure what I was doing about this, you know, like just do a bit of self assessment too. Okay. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Go and have a little walk around the block to wait for us. Oh, yeah. We'll nuts. have an hour and ten minutes. Okay, well, do, do whatever you want with your right. hour and ten minutes. But oh, thank you all. So I am here next week, and then the week after that is the lovely Jane.